This month marks the 30th year that Mumia Abu-Jamal has been in a Pennsylvania prison for the convicted um, of the shooting and death of uh, police officer Daniel Faulkner. Um, on December 9th, there will be a mega event at the National Constitution Center that will be a forum for discussing his case in light of the many twists and turns it has taken and in light of the recent decision by the Supreme Court to declare the death sentence that he was given unconstitutional. This is uh, State Representative David Richardson, who was at a Mumia rally before he passed some time ago, talking about the Mumia case. That you got a lot of us that are willing to go to battle because the freedom ain't gonna never be free unless we take it. There's too many of us sitting around thinking that it's gonna come to us on some damn silver platter. Wake up, you fools, and understand this man has no respect for you, none, none whatsoever. And they will continue to do what they do to Mumia only because they feel that you don't have no heart. Well, let me just say this to y'all. I want to send a message to the FOP. I want to make it loud and clear so there won't be any mistake about what's being said today. And I'm saying it as a black man in the city of Philadelphia and not as the state representative. I ain't scared the hell of y'all. And I'm not going to let you intimidate our people either. That's over. So when you come home with some threat about you going to boycott every event that we have and you want to stop the people from coming to contribute their money, get the hell out of our way because we ain't going nowhere. The time has come for everybody to wake up and realize that this ain't no joke. We're not going to let you take Mumia's life. And we want to send a message to America that the death penalty has got to end. We're going to wipe it out the same way they did in South Africa. But they did it by power of the people. When Nelson Mandela stepped out of jail and threw his hands up in the air, he was a strong brother. After 27 years being in jail, it didn't cripple his spirit. And I want to let all of you know that I've come from all across this country. You got some brothers and sisters in Philadelphia that are willing to rumble no matter what and ain't afraid of the Philadelphia police the National Police, the FOP, and all the rest of them that come together with it. Because we know in Philadelphia that there have been some strong brothers and sisters in the Philadelphia Police Department who are African American, who have stood up and have said that they, in fact, are against the death penalty and they, in fact, want a new trial for Mumia Abu-Jamal. Not only did it come from the National Association of Black Police Officers, but it also came from the Philadelphia Garden Civic League. And I want to put that on the record here today. In my conclusion, I just want to say I know the time has been rough today, but a lot of y'all need to to know what this looks like for many of us here in the city of Philadelphia. Governor Ridge is getting a message again. Not only did those 115,000 calls go on, that's an underestimated of the number that have been calling, as an underestimated number of those who signed petitions, as an underestimated number of those who have come in and out of the city of Philadelphia from all across this country to give the kind of solidarity that's needed in order to make sure we free more media Abu tomorrow. We're not going to take this line down. And I know that Mumia in his heart knows that we're all with him. So brothers and sisters, we're here as freedom fighters and black liberation strugglers who understand the importance of who and what we are. And we ain't going to let no titles get in the way. Free Mumia. Free Mumia. And that was our beloved brother, David Richardson, um, with his call to free Mumia. This speech was given, I believe, in August of 1995. And one of the things that he said is clearly ringing in everyone's ears, which is, we're not going anywhere, that the, the fight to free Mumia and the fight to get him a fair trial um, has now, as many of you know, become a cause celeb, not just in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania or the United States, but all around the world. And the event at the National Constitution Center this Friday um, will give um, voice to another set and generation even of people who are becoming familiar with the Mumia Abu-Jamal case and have taken up the call not only to free Mumia but to look at what the Mumia case means for the abolition of the death penalty and also for the mass incarceration of black men. Joining me today, right, come on over here, sister, <laughs> is, what, is one of the... 
the spirits and the driving forces and the people who never, ever, ever gave up on Mumia. And and really, in my mind, Pam Africa has been the heart of this movement. And Pam, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Talking Drum Lines. Mm, thank you. And on the move. And on the move to our WRD family listening audience. Um, well, you know, we, we, and we are embracing um, this uh, moment, if you will, because lots and lots of things have happened this year right. that, that portend um, good things, we hope, for the ultimate um, effort to free Mumia. And, and I just have to say on the record, in case you haven't guessed, I never thought Mumia was guilty. And we have always thought that there were too many wrong things that happened from the minute evidence started getting collected on the street to the trial to the penalty phase. And so we're going to really talk about this today and a special surprise for our audience. We're being joined, one, by um, Johanna Fernandez, who made that wonderful film um, uh, examining Justice the case. Trial, Justice the case on trial. Yes, that premiered about a year ago um, yes. here at the mm-hmm. Constitution at Center. At the Constitutional Center. And, and, God bless his heart, Mumia is supposed to join us in about seven minutes. That's right. And so, stay tuned. Live from death row. Live from death row. And, um, well, hopefully not on death row for, he is. for a minute long, yeah. too many minutes longer. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, first of all, is Joanna with us? She's not here yet? Okay. Um, we're going we're gonna to get to Joanna in a minute. But, Pam, let's, first of all, tell people sort of about this December 9th event so that we kind of can set the stage. Okay. Well, the December 9th event is people coming together to take a stand, an upfront stand where people can see this is being broadcast around the world on December the 9th and all the events going on in London and Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, all throughout the United States because we cannot, we will not accept the illegal behavior of this government thinking that we will accept them saying life prison without the possibility of parole. That is good for somebody who might be innocent. I mean, guilty. Guilty. And uh, but Mumia is innocent. He have a worldwide movement, and you can't get around the facts that every legal court that we went to and are uh, blatantly openly broke every law that it is to get to where we're at today. And we're not accepting it. And all we as freedom loving people and all and who and believe who, who believe in fairness and just fairness, in fairness right. and real justice. Right. You know, and, and I think um, Dr. Fernandez is on the line with us. I wanna just before we, we welcome you, Johanna, um, talk a little bit more about who is coming to this event because this this is happening as I say at the National Constitution Center, but such luminaries as Cornell West, yes. Michelle Alexander, mm-hmm. Vijay Prashad, Immortal Technique, mm-hmm. Mark Lamont Hill, our own Ramona Africa, and our own Michael Cord, mm-hmm. Amiri and Amina Baraka, Baraka yes. ha- are going and to uh, give voice also, to this. Also, you know, the voice of Judge uh, Mathis and all who, on um, after the execution of Troy Davis, and all stated very clearly um, that. This was wrong, and this is every reason why we should abolish the death penalty. He, what he did, he went on TV with his robe and on a bench and stated very clearly that what went on there, he put all the legal points there and pointed out judges don't break rank like this to speak out against, you know, injustice like this. But he was compelled to do this, and for people who don't know, and all uh, Troy Davis' sister, who fought for his life, and all uh, you know, past um, Sunday oh, or, oh, or either yeah, Saturday, yeah. I think it was, and you know, her funeral services and memorial is December ninth and tenth as well, coinciding with the things that we're doing for Mamiya, and all. Uh, but you know, we must never ever forget, you know, what happened there, and that's a big part of our program. What happened to him and so many other shock, shock us in Kofa. And, uh, you know, who we said we'll never forget, Zion Israel. And Tookie Williams had a very colorful past, but what he was killed for, he was not guilty of. And, you know, that's our point. We've just seen too, too many cases of wrong, either completely wrongful convictions or convictions that were so murky and messy that they raised questions about the justice system. And that is, in fact, what... um, 
Johanna Fernandez's film was, it raised questions about how the justice system failed in the Mumia case. And I believe Johanna is on with us. Uh, Johanna, welcome, and, and thank you for your work and your commitment. Thank you very much for having me on the show, for having Pam Africa, and for giving this case a voice uh, in Philadelphia. Now, let's help people understand where we are. Well, the big news that we have heard most recently was that the Supreme Court upheld several lower court decisions that declared the death penalty in the Mumia case unconstitutional. But that's not quite the same as getting a, a new trial. Can you help us put that in perspective and just sort out the facts? Right. So essentially, the Supreme Court held that the sentencing hearing was unconstitutional. Unfortunately, they did not uh, make a statement um, on the conviction of uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal. What people must understand is that in all death penalty cases, there is a conviction phase and a sentencing phase that determines whether the defendant will get life in prison uh, or determines his sentence or the death penalty. And so what the Supreme Court has said is that the sentencing uh had problems because the jury was misinstructed. Part of what we are saying, however, is that the conviction trial was presided over by the same judge, the infamous and racist Albert Sabo. It was presided over by the same prosecutor and by the same jury. So if the Supreme Court has said that there was a problem with one phase of the trial, doesn't that call into question the entire conduct of the trial from beginning to end in both phases? And I want to just emphasize that the creed of the DA's office is thus, above all, seek justice. That's what the DA's office tells us, that we are, as citizens, as judges, as jurors, supposed to seek justice in a case. And uh, the DA, the former DA, Lynn Abraham, told us that where there is evidence that one of the officers lied in court, cases will be discarded. We have concrete evidence that in Mumia's case, the police tampered with evidence to obtain a conviction. And Mumia's case is not an isolated incident, right? There are plenty of cases in Philadelphia that have been thrown out because it's been discovered that the cops tampered with evidence to obtain a conviction. Harold Wilson's case, who was on death row alongside of Mumia Abu-Jamal, is a perfect example. He was accused of killing three people. And not long ago, he was exonerated and released from the same death row where Mumia uh, is sitting, and he was essentially tried by the same system. So if there was corruption in Harold Wilson's case, these are the same courts, we are arguing, that framed Mumia Abu-Jamal. And we actually have photographs, the Polakoff photographs, that demonstrate how Officer James Forb is mishandling the guns that were supposedly um, retrieved at the scene of the crime. In court, Officer James Forbes says that he properly handled the gun. That is the guns. That means that there is So you're evidence. saying that in itself is is enough has been enough cause in other cases to exactly. throw to throw out convictions. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, one of the things I think, Johanna, that, that a lot of us who have followed this case for thirty years have thought have seen is that there have been repeated failures of the justice system in, in, in the Philadelphia courts. And clearly your film raises lots of questions about um, discrete points of failure from the beginning where you were saying that the evidence was mishandled. Can you also talk about, and, and this is a question for Pam as well, um, some of the other facts of the case that, that are being questioned um, from a legal point of view and that should at least from some people's point of view, um, form the basis for um, getting a new trial? Well, um, Judge Ambro of the Third Circuit Court actually said, quote, I see no reason why we should not afford Abu Jamal the courtesy of our precedents. 
He was uh, talking about Batson, which essentially is essentially um, the Johanna, issue. Johanna, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we are getting that call that we've been expecting. Okay, Can great. I just have you hold on for yes, a minute yes, and uh, until we sort this out? Just hang on. Um, we are about to, I believe, um, talk to, to Mumia Abu-Jamal. We're getting that set up right now. Pam, I can't Free tell Mumia. you how... Free Mumia. Free Mumia. Free Mumia. Um, I believe that Mumia Abu-Jamal is joining us on the line. I believe he is. Oh, my on Lord. The on the <laughs> <laughs> I am almost... I'm almost without words, Mumia. Almost well, without words. I cannot tell you what a joy it is to hear your voice. Oh, thank you so much. And it's a joy to hear yours. It has been many years. Many, many years. And so I have to ask, because I'm sure people in our audience want to know, just on a purely human and personal level, how are you doing? How have you endured this for all of these many years? Uh, sometimes I ask myself that. But of course, I'm strong. I'm well. I feel surrounded by a sea of love. And uh, the struggle continues. It, it, well, it certainly does. And this year, it has. Um, we've seen the first w of what I think of as a real spot of light in terms of the, the decision that the, the Supreme Court made. Um, and so I, I want to start with a little bit of like 101, if you will, for people who are coming to this new, because I think a whole new generation is now becoming familiar with your case, of why you feel your case is important and connected to what has now become an international mass movement, to not just to abolish the death penalty, but but now with Michelle Alexander kind of getting in on this to, to um, fight against the mass incarceration of black men? Well, I think there are a few reasons. Um, some are, of course, related to my case, but some are much broader than that. And I think that uh, part of it is simply something called experience. And I say that to say that um, Angela Davis, uh, in her first autobiography, uh, if they come in the morning, wrote about how uh, there was a struggle against what she called and what many of her contemporaries, and I was one of her contemporaries, called fascism in the United States. We were complaining about the prison system back in the 1970s. Of course, we were talking about people like Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver and Angela Davis and uh, George Jackson and other black revolutionaries. In point of fact, back in the early 1970s, if you looked across the whole country, you would probably find 250,000, maybe 310,000 people in prison, state and federal, all across the United States. Well, if you look around this country today, you will literally find millions of people in prison and jails, federal and state, many, many of them African-Americans, many of them African-American men, women, and juveniles. And she, somewhat recently, and in her recent book on prison this evolution... This is from the State Correctional Institution at Green and is subject to monitoring and recording. And in her recent book on prison abolition said, it was unthinkable back in 1971. It was unimaginable to think that there would be millions of people in prison and there wouldn't be some kind of revolt, rebellion against this kind of situation. Well, I think we're seeing the beginning of that, uh, at least intellectually and scholarly, through the work of Michelle Alexander. But most people uh, know it through their family. They know about their son. They know about their husband. They know about their father. They know about the, their daughter, uh, their uncles, their aunts, their family. And um, we are... 24, no, I'm sorry, 6% of the world's population. But the prison population in the United States is 26% of the world's prison population. No other country in the world houses that percentage or in the raw numbers. I mean, not even China, which has like four times our population. What does that tell you? Well, I, I, that kind of leads me to my next question, because I, what, I, what I think it tells me is that at this point, um, there, are, there are two trains running. One has to do with money in terms of running a for-profit prison industry, um, and the other has to do with something that I heard you describe in an interview as, um, as a, the prison industrial complex being kind of an answer to the problem of having too many poor, too many minority, too many 
essentially surplus people. What are your thoughts uh, uh, about this, the, the trend that we're headed in? Well, I think you hit two good points, but let's go through Michelle Alexander if we can again, because she says something that, while I may have kind of hinted at it and written about it, I haven't mentioned it uh, strongly or more forthrightly. She describes the black working class and poor people in America as a caste, C-A-S-T-E, C-A-S-T-E. And she says this happened in large part because the black bourgeoisie and the black middle class essentially told the political leadership, a la Clinton and all them, look, you protect affirmative action and we don't care what you do with the rest of those people. Now think about how how many people have talked about Michelle Alexander's book, how many people have read it, I think at least 100,000 by now. But people don't talk about that because that's too hot, you see. Um, she does, of course, but I'm talking about reviewers. I haven't read a review that has touched on that. And I think that's a powerful point. That suggests that prisons have more to do with uh, what you said, kind of an excess population, you see, and a way to also um, fund the prison industrial complex in terms of hundreds of thousands of jobs for people, you know, prison guards and judges and so forth. But it's even more insidious than that because when you are, let's say, locked up in Philadelphia or in Harlem or in Roxbury in Boston and you go way upstate to a rural prison, well, when the census is taken, you're counted as part of that rural population and federal money that would have gone to your home neighborhood where your family and your loved ones and your parents or children are living, that money goes up to the rural district, except you're not counted in terms of a vote because you cannot vote. So your ideas, your hopes, your fears are not taken into consideration, but your body is. You're counted as a resident of a distant rural county. So that does two things. It enriches the rural county with a false population count, and it also um, impoverishes the inner cities of Harlem, of North Philly, of Roxbury, because that federal money that would have gone for education or transportation or health care goes somewhere else. So that's, you know, well... You know, the pain of this is is tremendous in many of these ways, as you have mentioned. And, and here's another one that I'd like you to, to, to react to, if you would. We recently learned that the plan for how many prison spaces to build in Western PA is being predicated on the test scores of third grade children in the Philadelphia public school system. And it seems to me that if there's any more of a clear kind of arrow pointing at, at what plans are for us, that's it. Uh, I heard you after, I didn't hear you after you said predicated, I'm sorry. Uh, it's predicated question? upon the test scores of third grade children in wow. Philadelphia public schools. Wow. Uh, didn't hear that, didn't know that. Uh, I'm a little surprised, but only a little surprised. But we, we really do live in a prison industrial complex. And think about this. Not only um, have kids been shortchanged in terms of their educational system, from the elementary to the high school level. Uh, there are some cities like Baltimore with uh, less than 50% graduating. I remember reading some statistics, it was like less than 70, I mean, uh, uh, more than 70% did not graduate from high schools in Baltimore. Um, so you take money out of these schools, you barely educate or miseducate these kids, and then you build prisons in the western parts or the rural districts of these states. I mean, how insidious can you get? It, 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 as I say, the, the pain is just tremendous for, for our people, I think. I, I want to change direction, if you will, uh, just for a minute. As, as someone who has been sitting in that prison for 30 years, could you tell us why the death penalty is a form of cruel and unusual punishment? Well, there are many reasons. Um, it is racist, but also it is legally built on a fallacy. That is to say... If a prosecutor announces it is going, or he or she is going for a death penalty, something happens in that case that happens in no other case in American law, or really global law, they're able to select what is called a prosecution-prone jury. That is, a jury who 
having heard not one word of legal fact, has decided before they are sworn in as jurors that they could return a death penalty. If someone has a question and says, well, maybe yes, maybe no, they're removed. If someone says, certainly, I don't believe in it, they're removed. And there have been several uh, highly regarded legal studies and scholarly studies on this by sociologists and uh, psychologists and whatnot. And they found that these jurors are far more prosecution prone, far more willing to convict, and far less willing to give the legal entitlements to which an accused or a defendant is supposed to have. What that means is um, the prosecutor is able to get far more first-degree murder convictions and therefore able to, after that, turn around and go for a death penalty than they could have if they had a juror uh, who is really a cross-representation of the community. See? And, so and, that's, and that's, Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and we have seen and talked... Uh, you, you can't hear us necessarily up there, but about that kind of injustice a lot on, on WURD. Um, and we actually have Bill Anderson here with us, and I, I want to give him a minute to, to shout at you, if, if you will, but, but just wanted to, to sort of press a minute. And uh, we, we very rarely hear live from death row about how what it feels like to be facing the death penalty every day for 30 years. And, um, and, and, and if it isn't too painful for you, I, I hope that you could give our audience a little bit of, a, of an idea, just a glimmer of an idea. Well, first of all, uh, welcome, Bill. It's been many years, I think maybe 10 or 15 years since I've talked to you. I'm sorry, I didn't know the mic was on. It has been a minute. And I didn't come in to hijack the interview. People want to hear from you. I just wanted to say, stay strong, man. God bless. Thank We're you, always brother. in support. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, well, it's, a little, it's like a, a little piece of hell. I mean, uh, you're alone a lot. You're in a cell uh, 22 hours out of a 24-hour day. And for many men, it's 24 hours and really weeks and months and years where they're literally in a cell by themselves the size of the average bathroom. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like what people used to say when Malcolm said he was in prison and they would get shot. And he said, don't be shocked because I said I'm in prison because we all in prison. As long as you live south of the Canadian border, you're in prison. And I say that to say uh, Oscar Grant wasn't on death row or was he? Hmm. Amadou Diallo wasn't on death row or was he? Uh, you know, uh, we could really list Sean Bell from New York. We could list names for a half hour two hours, ten hours. And none of these people were on death row. They were theoretically free. They were walking the street. They thought they were American citizens entitled to all the rights and privileges to which the Constitution grants them. But they didn't have a right to drive while black or to walk down the street while black or answer their door while they're black. Uh, Oscar Grant didn't have the right to get off a subway in California, in Oakland, while he was black. They were on death row. They didn't know it. But guess what? They were on death row. Mm -hmm. And until we change this system, we're all on death row, believe it or not. Um, Mumia, you you know this event is coming up on the ninth, um, and um, and folk are gathering at at no more ironic a forum than the National Constitution Center. Um, as you look at that event and the people who are going to to give voice to these issues, um, and the f uh, folk who are coming and those who are not, what what do you want people to to get to take from it? What's the takeaway? Well, that people should always speak out against any injustice affecting anyone. Uh, Martin Luther King said an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And it is ironic that it's the Constitution Center because, you know, when it comes to the Constitution, all of us, not just myself, I mean, we get short shrift. Uh, we have 60 seconds remaining. We're the one people in this country who have never truly been given constitutional rights despite what is written in the Constitution. It took them 100 years to decide no matter what the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment said, that black people should vote. And we still get, look what happened in the year 2000. We still get denied the right to vote. So uh, the Constitution is a beginning. It's a starting point, but it cannot be an end. We have to fight for all of our rights, all of our time, all of our lives. Amumia, I know we've been given the, the 60 second warning, and so um, is there anything that you want to say that, that, that I haven't asked you about or that you think is important? Well, 
I thank you for this opportunity and this brief time. It goes by so quickly. It is a pleasure, again, to hear your voice and to hear the voices of my brothers and sisters who are there, people who I love. And, uh, Bill, thank you again for stepping in. I know you didn't hijack it, but it's great to hear your voice. On the move, longer, John Africa. I love you all. On the move. On the move. Thank you so much. And, um, Free Mamiya! Free Mamiya! Free Mamiya now! Brothers and sisters... You're listening to WURD 900 AM. This is the Talking Drumline. I'm Barbara Grant. With me is Pam Africa um, with the Free Mamiya Movement. Also on the line is um, Dr. Johanna Fernandez. And you've just listened to an exclusive interview live from death row with Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, he will be the subject, his case will be the subject of um, discussion at the National Constitution Center this Friday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Now, I believe that the it's a free event? Yes? yes it is. Okay. Free. And what we're asking people to do, because the place only seats 900 and the Constitutional Center is very strict, to assure that you have, you know, seating. In fact, we do have seating and all with, at WRD, um, you know, um, special seating and all for for our 900 members. Yes, yes. And uh, um, so, but other than that, you can go to December 9, D-E-C-E-M-B-E-R, the number 9, Mumia's initial M-A-J at gmail.com or you should with Bill, yeah. You get now? Well, you know what? We can give away some tickets right now. Um, right. So for the next uh, few minutes, if you call in, we'll be glad to uh, give away some tickets to the um, National Constitution Center's forum on Mumia Abu Jamal. No more death penalty. What is it? We now we're there giving these signals and stuff. We we want to give out a number. It's two one five four two five seven eight seven five. You can call that number and um, for the ne- next. And all day long, we'll give away tickets to this um, to this incredible event. You want to be there. This is a case that is a symbol of what's happening in our justice system and, mm-hmm. and in this generation. Right. We can't let this moment pass before we become known as people who stood up against the death penalty right. and who stood up against this kind of injustice uh, that that's being perpetrated, not just to Mumia. You know, we have to understand that as much as we love Mumia, he's mm-hmm. a symbol. Right. You know, he's standing in the gap for many, many people. And and w- Bill is with us and, and just was whispering to us over the break that one of the, the points that Mumia made that peop- about how black people get plucked off death penalty um, cases is um, actually happened to him. And so, uh, so Bill, tell us just a little bit about your experience to, to kind of, you know, fill out what some of this, what some of this is about. You know, it... Very quickly, it was, I got, or, I'm sorry, mic check. Um, yeah, it was, I actually got called in for jury duty, and they explained going in that it was a death penalty case. Young African-American man who was sitting there, and they give you all the instructions about, you know, this is a death penalty case, your feelings about the death penalty case, do you have any opposition to it? Uh, and, of course, I gave the short answer, yes, I have some questions about it. Uh, and then the judge and the two attorneys called me into the back room, and started asking a whole bunch of questions. What is your problem with the death penalty? And I said that I know that the death death penalty is disproportionately given to African Americans, particularly African American men. So I would have a lot of questions about sitting on a jury in a death penalty case because I don't believe it's fair to African Americans. So son, you're telling me you're not willing to follow the laws of this land. I said, Your Honor, I didn't I didn't say that. I said that I would have to be very sure because you're talking about taking someone's life and I believe the system is flawed, statistically and otherwise. And this, slowly but surely, the judge just got more and more angry with me, told me that I was not somebody who knew how to follow the laws of this land and why was I in his courtroom. And, uh, and, and after a while, he just finally said to me, well, you know what, if you're not somebody who believes in our laws, then you should just get out of this courtroom. And, and, me out. and he sent you out. And see, and I think, and I'm not trying to disqualify black people from being on juries because I think that all of us can make decisions based on a body of evidence. But I was in that situation too, Bill, and when the judge said to me, the judge says to you, well, can you follow the law? Because I got, I, well, I didn't get pulled into the back room, but <laughs> I got isolated. And um, would you be able to follow the law if I instruct you in the law? And what I had to say to him was, 
I don't think so necessarily. And and here's my my statement that's going to get me in trouble, which is. If we were always followers of the law as African Americans, we'd still be slaves. That's Give it right. A break. Mm-hmm. I mean, we mm-hmm. were, that was legal in this country at one point. And so I think you have to you have to be honest in terms of examining on a case by case basis what is happening. But but you're right. I mean, I I, I don't feel good. But you know, what Barbara, may I interrupt here? Sure. Because this, this is Johanna me, um, Fernandez. Yeah. This brings me to a point that was made by attorney, um, an attorney in the film uh, I made, Justice on Trial. She's a black attorney, actually the first uh, black woman to graduate from the University of Pittsburgh Law School, Martha Conley. She said in my film that the justice system is broken, essentially, for African Americans, because African Americans have a different experience with the law and the police. That's right. And we are disproportionately excluded from the jury pool. So if an African American jury hears testimony from the police, an African American juror is more likely to question it, because we have direct experience with the cops that tells us day in and day out that they are not upstanding uh, citizens of our city. And systematically, black jurors are excluded from the jury because they don't agree with the death penalty. So the right to a trial by juror, by, by a, peer, a, a trial by a, uh, a jury, jury, of, jury your peers of your peers is yeah. violated day in and day out. And in Mumia's case, 11 out of 15 African-American jurors were struck by the prosecutor and by the judge on the basis of race. And this was the issue that I was alluding to previously. Judge Thomas Ambro of the Third Circuit Court actually said, yes, I see discrimination in jury selection in Mumia's case, and I don't see why we are not affording him the courtesy of our president, meaning that in previous cases where the defendant essentially made the same claims of discrimination, we granted them a new trial, and we're denying Mumia a new trial. Let me also say that this is not about Mumia. All of the issues in Mumia's case, all of the violations, all of the grievances are also responsible for the mass incarceration of black and Latino males in the United States, making their mass incarceration the most important civil rights crisis of our time. What are those violations? Discrimination and jury selection, prosecutorial misconduct, the fact that Joe McGill actually concealed very important exculpatory evidence from the trial, racial bias on the part of the judge. Judge, Judge Albert Sabo was overheard saying by a court stenographer, quote, I'm going to help them fry the nigger, referring to how he was going to instruct the jury. And finally, tampering with evidence on the part of the police to obtain a conviction. Fifteen of the 35 officers who collected evidence in the Mumia Abu Jamal case were arrested immediately after his case for tampering with evidence to obtain a conviction, an FBI probe of the police department in Philadelphia, the first ever civil rights investigation of the police department in the United States was of the Philadelphia police department. But the jurors could never have known that 15 of those cops were probably lying. So again, all of these issues are not particular to Mumia. They are what today has presented to this um, uh, this generation our moral assignment and mass incarceration because it it's racist. It targets African Americans and Latinos, increasingly immigrants and Mexicans, and the poor. Um, cu- couple of things, and we do want to take a couple of calls before we before we leave. Um, one of the things that your film raises is this issue of of what people would consider new evidence, although it probably was evidence that was around and and was squashed and, and now and, and, and I guess there's a fine difference between that but a piece that really just stuck with me was that there was another actual witness to what happened well, the existence there was of a man a named Kenneth Freeman. There was a fourth person at the scene of the crime, a man by the name of Kenneth Freeman, who was Billy Cook's business uh, uh, partner. He was identified as the person sitting in Billy Cook's car. Uh, And actually, uh, 
in Officer Faulkner's shirt pocket, there was an application, a driver's application that led the police immediately to Kenneth Freeman. But Joe McGill, the DA, actually concealed that fact at trial, that there was this fourth person at the scene of the crime, and that the word in the street was that Kenneth Freeman killed Officer Faulkner. Now, what's fascinating is that Joe McGill acknowledges the presence of Kenneth Freeman in Billy Cook's trial, which happened concurrently with Mumias. So that's an issue of perjury on the part of the DA. He concealed that important exculpatory evidence in Mumias' trial, but actually acknowledged it in Billy Cook's trial. Yeah, just and one. he was also, Kenneth Freeman was identified as the shooter by Cynthia White in a lineup. And, and Cynthia White was the, the prosecutor's um, key witness. Pretty much key witness, yeah. I, I, um, but this is what, what people don't know about this case, in part because Mumia has been painted into this monster. And part of what you heard, as you heard him, is that he's an incredibly reasonable and sensitive human being. Um, l- let me just uh, s- stop you a minute because we are getting flooded with calls for tickets <laughs> to this event. We want to reroute you if you're looking for a ticket to the event to the uh, to our front office, and that number is two one five four two five seven eight seven five. And we're glad to um, link you up with a ticket. Um, uh, Johanna, I know you're going to have to go soon, but would you mind if we took a couple of calls? Please, and let me also remind people that they can come early. They should be there at six thirty. This is a free event and we want as many people to come out as possible so if you can't get a ticket today come at 6 30. okay uh i think we have is it pd brown from germantown our first caller and questioner pd welcome well actually called to get a ticket so i'll call another <laughs> number uh, but when, uh, when the uh brother came on the phone i just got complete chills down my body you know pam Keep fighting, baby. We're right behind you, okay? And I return your calls, PD. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm just in business. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Then we have Jeremiah from Southwest. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm well, thank you. uh, A very, very good to show. Hello. And to uh, see you and your guests. Um, The, I want to make a comment about the, uh, the, uh, the segment of the show with the jury selection. Yes. And I'll make it real brief because I know we're coming up short on time. But uh, you and Bill stated that when you were questioned about having a problem with the death penalty, the death penalty, you stated that you had a problem, correct? Yes. It's that level of honesty that, yeah, we're honest with ourselves, but if we really want to help, we need to curtail that a little bit. I've had issues like that, too, and I curtailed it so I could be on that jury, so I could be that voice for that individual in there. And so often, so often, we don't do that. We want to be honest and say, yeah, these are our principles and we're going to stand for them. And every time we stand for our principles in that way, they X us out and then we can't help anyone. You know, you make an excellent point because, because honestly, I, I, I struggled with it because you're between a rock and a hard place. You do want to be honest, and yet um, it's true. If we do that repeatedly, we will never, we will continue to be plucked off juries. And so, Joanna, what, what, what do you see as sort of the, the, the path to a kind of righteous solution there? Well, quite frankly, I just think that we need to... Um, transform the public debate around imprisonment in this country, which is what Michelle Alexander argues in that book. We ultimately have to question a system in which you cannot participate because you oppose the death penalty. So I, I think that This is not an individual problem. No individual African-American, Latino, or person of conscience by lying to the courtroom is going to be able to change the systematic problem. We are talking about a nation of our people are in prison. A nation, a small nation, 2.3 million people. And we are going to have to really get Mumia's voice uh, 
in radio shows, but also get people discussing this in public discourse. What is going on? How is it that the system uh, is enslaving us once again after slavery? And historically, if you look at how change has happened, it's happened through mass struggle. If we, ha- if the kids who sat in on February 1st, 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina had not broken the law, we wouldn't be able to vote today. It, amen to that. And, and, mean, and that's exactly right. Sometimes you have to break, well, I'm not encouraging people to break the law on the one hand, but on the other hand, that's what civil disobedience is all about. Right. Right. Amen. Um, Amen. I want to I want to throw a question out to to both of you, um, which is, what is the next step here? One for Mumia, and um, and two for for this movement. Can you repeat that again? What What is the next step for oh, the next for the Free Mumia movement, the, and the, also then specific next steps for for Mumia in terms uh, of the next legal step? I'm going to have to exit soon. I actually have to go lecture at 12:50, okay. but I'm going to take five minutes. Um, we are actually calling on the DA's office to release Mumia because he has been held unconstitutionally on death row for 30 years. That is cruel and unusual punishment. Mumia has not touched a soul in 30 years, and now we are told that he should never have been on death row. But we also have exculpatory exculpatory evidence um, that no courtroom has actually reviewed. So we are calling on the DA to release him on the basis that the state has wronged him for 30 years. Um, And at this point, we've reached the end of the legal road um, for Mumia. Uh, The only thing that can potentially um, uh, get him a new trial is the emergence of compelling evidence that could not have been discovered through um, uh, through due process on the part of uh, of the lawyers. Uh, something like the Polakoff photographs, for example, which very clearly demonstrate that the police tampered with evidence, that can that is no longer admissible in court because it wasn't registered with the courts within 60 days, which just gives you a sense of the injustice of the system. If the lawyers, for whatever reason, did not were not aware of these photographs, the photographs were in the public sphere over 60 days and now the courts will not even look at it. But you know what too, Johanna, and uh, what is so unfair about this, the police had the photographs. They (laughs) never turned it over to the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole fact of how criminal this whole, you know, thing is. But they want us to go by what it is that they're saying. When everything they did was designed to kill Mumia. They broke every law. They want to tell us we should have had the photographs in 60 days. Well, what about the DA who had the photographs and all for years and all polygraph reports that he gave them the photographs in December? Then he turned of 90 of... Uh, 81. 81. Right. And then he turned around and gave them to him again in 95. And they told him that they had no use for him. It's documented he gave them the photographs. We never received them. You know, a photograph to show very clearly that when they said Mumia stood over top of Faulkner, shot down into the ground, and uh, as Faulkner was ducking from the bullets, the photograph showed there's not a divot, a pinhole in the ground. Lynn Washington and another journalist and uh, um, got together and they took the same caliber gun that they said was Mumia's and you know and other ones and shot down into the ground in a piece of cement and uh, it took chunks out of it. So I'm saying if it's not there, it didn't happen. They keep getting caught in lie after lie. Judge Sable, you know the Daily News front page went and said how insane that this man was, how he was caused and problems and you know that you know that was just unbelievable and uh but yet and still mumia sits there clearly innocent 
Um, I, I, Johanna, I know that you have to go, and, and we've like borrowed your time, you know, five minutes longer than we had to. So I just want to thank you for um, so for being with us, and we look forward to um, hearing from you on Friday and um, and being at that event. It's going to be a very unique situation um, and a moment in our history that that you don't want to miss. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Barbara. And let me just say that we're inviting the DA, we're inviting the press, we're inviting everyone in Philadelphia to join us in um, in an honest conversation about this case. I think we're even that inviting is, Tiger Hill. We're <laughs> even inviting oh, yeah. Tiger, Tiger Hill. <laughs> Always yes. do. We think that this is a moment for actually righting a wrong. Um, that uh, that has been in the heart of Philadelphia for for too long. It's been 30 years, and, and we're really asking people to join us in this very important conversation. And in the words of the DA's creed, above all else, seek justice. Seek justice. Johanna, thank you very much. And Pam Africa, I can't thank you enough for um, being with us and making this possible for us to talk to um, to Mumia today and to hear from our beloved brother David Richardson. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's it for um, Talking Drumline today. Uh, you're listening to 900 AM WURD on air, online and in the community. Stay tuned for the Reverend Al Sharpton. As always, he'll be keeping it real.